Okay. So, so it's not recording. So hi everyone, good morning. Welcome to the lecture called like machine learning for economics. So my name is Anna and today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker who is Jose Vajales Ruiz. So Jose currently works at the Department of Economics at the Catholic University of the Most Holy Conception in Chile. And he got his PhD at the University of Utah. He does research in monetary economics, macroeconomics and econometrics. So Jose, thank you so much for being here today. We are very <laughs> excited for to listen to your lecture and the floor is yours. You have like an hour. I will let you know when your time is finishing up and then afterwards we can have a Q&A session. So the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. I, I, as I told you before, it, it's a huge pleasure to me uh, to kind of in, try to introduce uh, economists into the machine learning literature, which is sometimes a little bit intimidating because just it sounds so different from econometrics you know or a normal or normal training but you will see that actually it's kind of the same you know <laughs> but with different words you know so uh so when it was you notice that i changed a little bit the title um uh the first thing i i put there is that i i uh, it's a biased introduction. I try to follow the normal uh, kind of normal introduction to machine learning, but it still it's a pretty biased introduction because I, I I I work in mostly in time series and I try to apply machine learning for time series. So that's my 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 feel. So but I try to cover uh, um, a sufficiently broad, you know. Um, uh, area so you can have the broad picture and then you can pick what you want to do or what you the the the, the tool that you need and then you know kind of zoom there you know uh and then also i changed that uh at the end for economists in, instead of economics just because i i when i started to dig into the machine learning literature is it uh, i face many walls you know uh, but many of them were uh, just, uh, as I told you, the jargon of the of the field. So I hope this can kind of give you a general picture, and then we can you know discuss other things. Okay. So okay. So what I want to show you, as I told you, is some preliminary definitions. Then discuss some statistical cultures, which is quite important because you usually, uh, if you are uh you are your your only training is econometrics you 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 come to machine learning with your mind kind of done you know structure in a way which is different from the which is kind of different uh in the machine learning literature and then i want to discuss some problems of representation of data capacity overfitting underfitting types of machine learning algorithm and finally something that i, I liked a lot uh, which is the natural language processing Okay, so uh, at the beginning, when I was pre preparing this presentation, I source every single stuff, you know, like every picture, every code there. Uh, but then it was too much, you know, since this is a kind of a general introduction, it's all taken from other places and even my work. So I, I, I rather prefer to give you a straight up, you know, the, the, the citations here, you know, so I the first book that i started to to learn from is the, the the first one there from uh from christopher bishop the pattern recognition and machine learning it's a some kind of the bible uh, in several fields for machine learning and then there are others which are, are pretty great you know for example the, the the elements of statistical learning and recently these other two which are uh, uh, from Steve Branton, Washington University, data-driven science and engineering, machine learning, uh, dynamical system and control. And I love that book because it's just, it makes machine learning with dynamical system, which is my field, you know? And uh, before that, you can have a lot of information, but basically uh, of mixing machine learning with dynamical system, but it was, it was all uh, kind of, uh, in paper, so you didn't have the textbook treatment that sometimes you need, you know, to understand some some concepts. And then finally, uh, well, then you have deep learning. 
It's an amazing book. These are the godfathers of the machine learning and deep learning literature. And finally, this blog, which is Medium, which is, I mean, for data science and machine learning, it's so cool because uh, you have a lot of people that work in real, real problems, you know, uh, that give the code and, and show you examples and the problems. You know, usually when you face a data set, you have a lot of problems that you have to solve. And this, uh, uh, this is a great source of tricks, you know? <laughs> okay, so also I wanna emphasize um, uh, that if you are an undergrad or graduate student and you have free time, <laughs> try to learn uh, some lang programming language, you know? And I took this survey that Kaggle is a web page where you have some competitions in machine learning. Uh, they, they, they run this survey every year and they, they ask the data scientists which uh, language they use, among other questions. And usually you have here the rank of the, the, the languages, you know? And the king in machine learning lit literature is Python. I mean, that, that's a king, you know, and you have everything there and big tech companies like Google, they post their code there. So, so if you are interested in learn a, co uh, um, a language and you're interested in machine learning, yeah, you have to start for, for Python, you know? Uh, okay, so let me start off with uh, some preliminary definitions. Uh, so what is machine learning? Uh, and, and this is, it will sound a lot like econometrics and it's because it is basically, you know? Uh, so uh, the, the first definition that I, I have here is that you, you want to make the computer, it's a science that made the computer to act or to de decide, you know, uh, to choose without being explicitly programmed. Okay, so you don't, if you, for example, you want to program a car to, you know, drive itself, you want, you normally should say, okay, if you see a red light or you see a pedestrian, you should stop, or you, if you see the green line, you should move, you know. Uh, instead of machine learning, you you show to the car or the software actually uh, many examples, and then the car itself can decide whether it has to stop or it has to, or it recognizes if there is a pedestrian there or something like that, you know. and. But then we have why it, this is a different field from econometrics. And, and, and the thing here is that there are different emphases. And these emphases are pretty blur. I mean, they intersect each other. They are tangent, you know, in many, in many ways, but still they are important. For instance, there is less emphasis in the statistical inference. So for instance, confidence intervals for the parameters, they don't care too much, you know? And this is something that I faced when I, I entered to the field. I wanted to get the confidence intervals of the parameters of the prediction. And it wasn't really easy because people were less interested in that, you know? Uh, there is less emphasis on the true model. And I covered that in the statistical cultures. And there is more emphasis on prediction. That's the whole goal because they want, for example, the, a car to, to to drive itself, and for that, you if they some someone is crossing, you know, in front of the car, they have to recognize, you know, if that thing is an animal or is a person, or you know. So the whole issue is about prediction most of the time, you know, and they they care a lot about computation and optimization. So how much time you would you take, you know, a program to run to calculate parameters? So it's kind of different the goals are a little bit different from us in econometrics but still you can you have a lot of intersection okay so so then what is a learning algorithm and let me read this definition it's basically it's basically a computer program is set to learn from experience e with respect to some class of tasks task t and performance measure p so you have experience so you want the computer to learn from experience to, to, make, to do some task, but you also have some performance measures. So something that says if you are doing good or bad, you know, in performing that task. So if it's performance as a, a task in T, 
as measured by P, improves with experience. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing, but it basically says, okay, let's put some experience here, you know, and measure, you know, your uh, the, the distance between your output and the output uh, that you get from your model, which is basically, you know, like mean square root or something like that, depending on the problem. And if with experience you improve that, we say that the computer learns. And maybe right now you are, you are getting a click, you know, saying that, okay, this is feeding a model to, you know, to a regression, it's a regression model or something like that. And then actually it is, you know, so learning is feeding. So let me show you this jargon. Uh, so for instance, here I have the statistical and econometric literature, which of course is an oversimplification because many econometric tools now are embracing machine learning, but still I'm trying to make the, the general picture, you know? So the more traditional and more econometric literature will think of a model, something that in the machine learning literature can be called a, a network or a graph. But then this is the main difference. And you know, when you read the papers, you get you can get the wrong idea. So for instance, for, for us, parameters in machine learning literature is gonna be weights and biases. So actually the weights are the slope if you think of a linear regression and the biases are gonna be the, the constant. Okay, so, but these are just parameters. Also you have tuning parameters. Yeah, and these tuning parameters are, for example, if you want to describe Y using X and this X, you just add the, the polynomial of that X. So X, X squared, X to the power three and so on. So actually when you run this kind of regression, um, you don't estimate the polynomial degree usually in your estimation process. What you do is you set that value by hand. And that's in machine learning literature is called hyperparameter. And most of the models in machine learning have a lot of uh, hyperparameters that you have to decide, you have to tune, you know, accordingly. But the thing is that these are just parameters which are not estimating during the learning algorithm or the feeding uh, process. And again, what, what we call feeding is what in machine learning literature, it is called learning. So every time I said a learning algorithm is basically feeding a curve or something like that, you know? Another important difference is that the independent variable in, in econometrics or the regressor in econometrics is called a feature. And the, the dependent variable is called a label, okay? And then you have two kind of different kind of categories to do machine learning, which are the most broad, uh, which are if you have a regression problem or a classification problem, which I'm going to define in a moment, but basically you say, okay, this is a car. I put a zero there. If, if this is a person, I put a one there. And you know, so you classify something. Uh, this is called a super supervised learning algorithm. Why? Because you give the label to the data. So you, for example, you, you present a picture to the software and then you say, okay, this is a person. Okay, so that the level, a person. And this is, a, if you have a cat in a picture, you say to the software, this is a cat. So that's supervised because you have a teacher, you know, telling you what is right, you know, and, and then you can kind of confirm if this is right or wrong, you know. Uh, and then you have this unconditional density estimation or clustering and clustering or dimensionally dimensional reduction. And this is called unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning comes from the fact that you don't have here a teacher, you don't have the, your, your label here. So instead of saying telling the software, this is a cat, this is a person, you just present the picture. So it is only the features there and the computer has to estimate the, 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 um, the density. Okay, so I hope that wasn't that uh, difficult or blurry, you know, uh, but we will take this in a moment. Uh, okay, so this is a picture from uh, the, the deep learning book. 
And I just wanted to concentrate in the, in the artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, circles. So artificial intelligence is the broadest field here. And, and, and there are several ways to do that. Uh, basically, a machine, artificial intelligence wants the software and hardware to choose and act, you know, by itself, you know, uh, when facing some problem, you know. Uh, and there are basically two ways to do artificial intelligence. The first way is knowledge-based uh, programming, which is hard code something, you know, so you say, okay, uh, if you see, a, if you want a car to, to drive by itself, you, you say to the car, okay, if you see a red uh, light, you stop. If you see a green line, you continue. So you, you give all the recipes and instructions beforehand to the computer. And many authors in the machine learning literature will say that this is wrong because you won't get all the cases there. It's, it's impossible because we don't know all the possibilities there. So one subfield of the artificial intelligence is machine learning. And machine learning basically, I, as I defined it before, it's basically, you don't tell what to do the computer so you because you present examples and the computer will calculate parameters and will decide whether or not to 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 act or to choose something okay so uh so i i i was reading this paper statistical modeling and the the two cultures uh by uh Brayman. Uh, and this is quite interesting uh, because I faced this when I started to read about machine learning. So he says that basically when you're faced with a problem of estimation, you, you have here, you have X and you have the nature mapping X to Y. Okay, so, and you don't know what it, what it means nature. I mean, it's a black box. You don't know the, you don't know the functions. Uh, and then you have this the data modeling culture, which is which I basically associated with traditional statistics or traditional econometrics, in which you fill this box or black box with some assumption. So usually this problem, the problem statement will say that, okay, let's assume that the relationship between these variables is linear and or any other or it has some distribution and then we calculate something. So we assume that something is true and we care about the true model. This is one statistical culture. On the other hand, you have the algorithmic modeling culture, which is kind of the machine learning uh, um, uh, field in which you don't know, you assume that you don't know the, this box, you know, but uh, you also, don't care too much to discover the true here. You just say, okay, so I, ha I have a problem. I have to predict why, and I have to do it as best as I can. So I use the best tools to do the job according to the data type, to the, the data length and all the characteristics, characteristics of, my, of my problem. So usually here you will use, um, decision trees, ne neural networks, and things like that. But it's a different way of thinking about this problem, you know, and, and you have to keep it in the back of your, of your mind. So if, uh, so uh, just because usual econometrics will start with a different question, you know, beforehand, and that can cause, cause you some uh, confusion. It, it happened to me when I started doing kind of the dynamical system with neural networks. Uh, I, I struggled a little bit with this, you know, so so just to prevent you, you know, to to, to fall into this part, this problem. Okay. Um, there is another pro important problem in machine learning, which is the problem of representation. And it is not usually a problem for us, but I, I I think that it's going to be a problem in the, in the near future. So let me let me explain this. So for instance, let me if I tell you divide 210 by six, you can come up with an easy answer. You know, 
But what happens if instead I give you the, the Roman numbers? So I tell you that, okay, divide CCX by BI. Yeah, you know, I don't know what this means. So I have, I probably have to Google it. And then I have to transform into these numbers. And then I, I do the, 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 the operation, right? So the comp for the computer is basically the same. You have some, um, you have some uh, some data, and you have to represent it in a way that the computer can understand, and that will determine the performance of your uh, algorithm or how good you will estimate something. Okay, so usually we face really easy problems of representation in econometrics. Usually we we can face gender, which is easy, you know. I mean, we use dummy variables. Uh, to do that usually uh, in, in or the, the states in a country, you know, you can build these dummy variables. And by the way, dummy variables in mature learning is called one hot encoding. It means the same, but it's with a fancier uh, wordy. Uh, but then, but sometimes it's really, really hard, you know? For instance, if you want, if you present a car, a picture of a car, into a machine learning model, and and you you think that if you see if the algorithm algorithm see a wheel there, then it the probability of having a car is high. But the problem is how we represent a wheel in as a feature, as an independent value, or in pixels of a picture. How we do it? Uh, even more important, now I have I have seen some works using Twitter. How you can use tweets in your regression model? You can have to encode your tweet in some way that your regression model can understand in, in numbers the words there, and then you can include that as a feature of your uh, uh, of your model, and then train or estimate your model. So for us, it's kind of easy. I mean, for me, as in dynamical system, is pretty easy because I always work with numeric data. But I, I think that if you want to work with sentiment analysis, so see if a text has some sentiment or something, you know, I have seen this for, for example, for in research using a statement from the central bank. So you have to measure the sentiment of 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 the of the statement. Uh, then you have to be really careful in how you represent these words into numbers so you so you can your model can uh, can uh, learn the sentiment you know so so the, the the bottom line is that for us probably it's a trivial problem but it, it can become really really hard and we have to keep it in the back or of our minds okay let me show you an example of representation so for instance here i have the cartesian coordinates of x and y, um, we the task is to divide the dots, the, the the green the green triangles and the blue dots. You know, okay. So you you easily can draw a circle there and divide these two areas. But it becomes much more easy if you transform this to a different coordinate. For example, polar coordinate. So if you remember, polar coordinate will have the the radius here r. So the distance from the origin and the angle here. So you will have the angle that it forms between the, the line and the, the, the X axis. So if you go to the Cartesian coordinate, you will see that it does, the data doesn't depend on the angle because if you circle around this, you will find both, uh, both uh, blue dots and green triangles. But if you, if you change the, the radius here, you will find that for, for small radius, you will get blue dots, and for larger radius, you will get uh, green uh, triangles. And this is actually what shows here. So for, for large R, you will get the green triangles, and for low R, you will get um, blue dots. And the thing here is that you can draw a line here more easily than you can draw a circle here. So that's basically telling you that representation is crucial for the computer to go fast and to learn the appropriate um, representation of the data. 
Another example is with pictures. I have told you that what happens if I present a card to the computer? Well, you can present a picture to the computer, and actually you can use as you can use word as um, or sentences as your features or your independent variable. You can also use pictures as independent variables. So you you can you can put this picture into some machine learning algorithm. This is a neural network. And then the neural network, this is our pixels. You divide this by pixels. And then the neural network will start to extract some edges, some corners and contours, some parts of the objects. And then it can decide whether this is a car, person, or, or an animal. But basically everything here, you start from the pixels of a picture and then you move and it, the algorithms should start extracting the main features of the data, hopefully automatically to, uh, to, to decide whether this is a car or a person, for instance. Okay, so representation again is quite important here. Okay, so capacity overfitting and underfitting. So usually in econometrics, we we take the whole sample because we are constrained by the sample usually, you know, we take the whole sample and we fit the model into our sample, okay? Uh, in machine learning, this is not advisable. And, and it, it is because you want to uh, have a, you want to generalize your model. So what means generalization? It means that your model, your trained model, Training, remember, it's basically fitting your model, your fitted model. You want your this trained model to perform well in unseeding data. So you want always that your model perform well in out of the, the sample for in an out, out of the sample forecast. So this is customary here. You you will the whole sample will be composed by this uh, rectangle, and then you will divide your sample between a training set, training fitting. So you are gonna fit your model here and your test set. And your test set is your out of the sample prediction. And, and the training set, you're, in the training set, you're going to fit your model. So you want to minimize the errors in your training set. And that error is called training error. But you care about that. But the problem is that if you add more features, the probability of getting a slower uh, training error is pretty big. So you don't care too much about the training error, but you care a lot about the generalization or test error. So you take your parameters and you apply to the test set. And that will give you the generalization error. Okay, so with that, we can, we can kind of assess whether our machine learning algorithm is good or not. Yeah. So what are the goals for a machine learning algorithm? First, that the training error is small. So let's go back. You, you want this training error to be really small, but also you want to make the gap between the generalization error or test error and the training error small enough. Why? Because since your model hasn't seen the test error, it's always it's gonna it's always gonna be larger than the training error. But you want the gap between these two errors be the, the smallest possible. Okay. So with that, we define what is underfitting. So underfitting is that our training error is not good enough. So it means usually that or we mess up in the construction of features, or we are not applying the right uh, algorithm you know, to the problem because it doesn't match, for example, the, the data type or something like that. Overfitting on the other side is that the gap between the training error and the generalization error is too large. Okay? And that comes something that is a capacity. So let me show you an example so it can get more, you can get more clear the idea. So for instance, suppose that you have these data points here. And you, the first thing that you do is you fit a, a, a straight line. You can see that the, the, the training error, which is the difference, you know, between the the uh, the, um, 
the, the, the line, the fetal time and the, the dots, it's pretty big, you know? So it's underfitting. If you find the appropriate capacity, maybe with a quadratic uh, um, regression, you will find that it fits pretty well, okay? But if you fit, for instance, uh, a, term, a cube term or much much larger uh, polynomial degree, you will find that it overfit. Why overfits? Because these are the training samples, but probably you get some some test samples which are out of the the which are out of the the training set over here, you know, where I'm pointing out with my mouse. So. Over here, you will get some test error, test uh, samples, you know? So if you put these samples around here, you will see that if you measure the difference between your this curve and the, the, the other uh, black dots, you will see a huge, uh, a huge uh, test error. So the same here. So suppose that you have a polynomial and you in, Get, you increase and increase and increase the, the degree of the polynomial. I have an example uh, uh, later about this, but usually you will get this kind of graph. You, you get here the, the error term and the capacity is gonna be the, the degree of the polynomial. You have the, the, blue, the blue line, uh, the training error and the green line, the test error. So you, you, you can clearly see that if you start to increase in the degree of the polynomial, the training error is going to be decreasing almost always, you know, because it, you know, you can always match any function with a polynomial, you know, without sufficient high degree. But the problem is that at some point, the test error is going to increase. Why is that? Because it is fitting pretty well the training data, but it, but it cannot generalize well, you know? So you get that the gap between these two errors is going to increase, you know, by by increasing the degree of the polynomial. Yeah, actually, the degree of the polynomial here is a hyperparameter. You you decide beforehand, you know, what is the going, what is the degree here. Okay, so so in which way we can in much in the machine learning literature we can kind of assess if our model is good or not, or if the de that degree of the polynomial is good or not. Well, we use cross-validation, and this is a huge topic in, in machine learning. But usually, uh, almost in any application, you use something that is called the K-fold uh, cross-validation, con which consists of once you divide your whole sample between the training set and the test set, you start dividing dividing the samples of the training set in training set, you know, for example, this is fourfold cross-validation because you have you have divided the training set in four parts, you know. Three of them are gonna be the training set. So you train your model or you fit your model in this part of the data. And the, the yellow one is gonna be the test set but this is not called test set because it's part of the training set. So it, this is called a validation set. Okay, and then you do this again. You separate this uh, this part, the, the yellow part of the data, as your validation test, and you fit the model again in the other part, and so on. And you do this four times. But the good thing here is that you can start to change your parameter, your hyperparameter, like the degree of the polynomial, you know, so you can get the feeling of what's going on here. The crucial thing with cross validation is that you never use the test set. Why? Because you want to generalize, and that means that you have to present some data to the algorithm after you fit the data to, to test whether you, you are doing good or bad. Okay, so cross-validation is a crucial step in machine learning in almost every algorithm. Okay, so another important thing of machine learning, so it's the different, it's the trade-off between variance and bias. So what that means, bias is bas basically the difference, well, we know, you know, with a lot of training in econometric, we know what is bias, it's basically the expected difference between, um, between your true uh, function and the, the, 
the estimated, the expected value of the, the, the estimated function. But also you have the variance, which is the, the variance from the estimated function. So let me show you this in more detail. You have the mean square error, the mean square error, sorry, can be decomposed in the bias square plus the variance of the model. And I did the math here, so you can check that this is right, but I just care about the final line. So this is this here in the left hand side, you have the square error, the, the mean square error. And in the right hand side, you have the bias square. So, so if your true function is f and your estimated function is f hat, you have the diff, the bias is going to be the difference between these two square, you know. So basically, you want the bias to be as small as possible just because you want to, in on average, attain the, the, the true model. But also you have another term, which is f hat, which is your estimated model minus its expectation a square. So that's the variance of your estimated model. So, so if you have a good model that basically represents the true model, but it, it's really unstable, so it has a lot of variance, it's it also is going to contribute to the high mean square error. Okay, so let me show you an example. I know that if this is the first time you're listening, to this it can be hard to understand, but let me show you this example. So suppose that I have an f function, uh, which depend on x, it doesn't matter too much, you know, but, and, you, and I added the error. The source is from medium. So I put it there in case you want to explore it. Uh, but basically you have the skeleton or the deterministic part of the model, you have X here, sorry, and Y here. And the deterministic part of the model is the red line. And the blue dots are the actual, uh, the actual samples, you know, because you have some error. So what this example does is it start with the, the, the simplest possible model, which is just the degree of polynomial zero. So basically a constant and measures, you know, the, the test error, the training error, but also the composition of the mean square, mean square error of the test set, which is the bias square and the variance of our estimated model. And then it start to add some more degrees of the polynomial. So basically here in D, you will get from zero degrees, which is a constant, one is a linear function, and then a square function, and so on. Okay. And here you have the error terms. Okay, so let me point out the, the, the black line. So you can see that the black line decreases almost always because in the every time you add a polynomial, you will capture more data, you know? But note what happened with the test error, which is the green line here. It decreases first, but then up to the degree two and then increases because just it, it doesn't generalize well, the model will larger degrees of the polynomial. And then you can see the composition of this green line, which is the, the, the mean square, square error of, of the test set. And you can see that the, 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 the yellow line is the bias square. So how good are you describing the true model? And by increasing the degree of the model, you see an, uh, an improvement, a drastic improvement, and then a modest improvement on the decreasing uh, bias square. But then in the blue, the blue dot uh, line, uh, you will see the variance of the model. And you will see that, uh, sure, the model with zero degree polynomial is pretty stable, but doesn't capture well the data. But then if you increase too much the degree of the polynomial, the model is gonna be quite unstable, okay? So these are the trade-off here that you have to balance. And the most probable model here is gonna be a, a model with a degree two of polynomial. Okay, so having said that, now let's see the type of machine learning algorithms. Okay. Basically, you have three categories. You have supervised, which I already commented, which is basically a regression model and you have unsupervised and you have semi-supervised models. So what is a supervised model? It's basically 
you have something that supervises your work. So you have your dependent variable, which tells you if you are doing good or you are doing bad representing some data. And for that, you have regression, which is we all know, you know. And in machine learning literature, you call a regression when your dependent variable is, is, uh, it is continuous. So if your dependent variable is continuous, you have a, a, reg um, a regression model. On the other hand, if you have uh, a discrete value for your, your dependent variable, then the model is going to be categorized as a classification problem. So for instance, if you have a picture, you have you can label like a car, um, a person, an animal. That, has, that it is a classification problem. And it's quite common in, in, in the machine learning literature. And then you have some models which are probably less familiar, uh, which you're probably less familiar with. So for instance, you have a support vector machine, decision trees, random forest, neural networks, and so on. And then you have the, let me go to the, to the far uh, right. Um, you have the unsupervised uh, type of machine learning algorithms. And then you have clustering uh, in which you have a K-means, algorithm and spectral clustering and dimensionality reduction, like pre probably you know this, pro principal component analysis, autoencoders, and things like that. And then you have another kind of uh, algorithm which are semi-supervised. And these are really cool. I don't know much about them, but these are algorithms that, uh, that basically you don't you have some part of your data legal so you have some dependent variable for some examples but for others for others you don't have the examples so your algorithm algorithm can learn the label or the dependent variable for that cases but also you have these networks you can simulate kind of some environment in which some agents can compete with with each other and they can have some reward function so they can learn to play the game, you know? Uh, so you can kind of simulate these agents and these agents get better and better and better in, on doing something, you know? So they learn from the environment. So actually it can help you to generate data when you don't have good enough data. Okay, so supervised learning, you have two main categories into this supervised learning, which is classification problem when, when yi is discrete and regression problem when this yi is continuous. And that's the jargon, you know, I mean, usually we, we talk about these things, you know, uh, discrete choice models, you know, and or something like that. And discrete choice models are just classification problems. And for instance, you have the linear regression, the linear regression model just will it will assume the normal distribution, you know, with the, the, the penalty function, the square, the, the mean square uh, error, you know, but also you can have the logistic regression. These are the discrete choice modeling, you know, when you say, okay, you have something, you put a one or you don't have something, you put a zero and that's your dependent variable and you estimate a, a model, okay? so. Theta transposed by X is just a linear, you know, it's a dot product there here, you know, by your parameter is theta and X is your feature or your dependent variable. And then you assume the only difference between the linear regression and a logistic, a regression is that you estimate the probability of Y equals one. And, and that has the Sigma is the logistic distribution. Okay, another, Algorithm, which is probably not well known in, in econometrics is the support vector machine. The, what is the support vector machine? It sounds really fancy, but actually the only thing that does is that it's separate hyperplanes. So for instance, here in the left, you have uh, blue dots and green, and green dots. And the only thing you want to do is to draw a line, a linear line, well, linear line, <laughs> kind of, Silly. <laughs> well, you draw a line here and to separate this upper plane, you know, and it seems easy here, you know, but you know, these problems can get really complicated. So above this line, you will get, 
you will decide for, to be a blue dot. Uh, below that line, you will decide to be a green dot. But also you can kind of come up with uh, more complex examples. For example, here you have some dots like mix it up. Uh, and I, I draw a green line and a blue line, you know, uh, and, and both are correct, you know. I mean, you can tune the hyperparameters of your algorithm to get both as correct. Why? Because in the green line, you kind of allow some missing values. So you allow that you don't get everything separate, you know, and that's an hyperparameter. But with the blue line, you don't allow that. So you know the 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 algorithm with the algorithm with twist these hyperparameters, you know, until it get everything separate, you know. But that's again, it's it's an hyperparameter. And here you have, of course, you can say, okay, but this, this is linear. What happens if I have something like nonlinear or cylindrical shape okay you can you can work with that because you have nonlinear support vector machine and oh, one thing that i didn't mention it's this is a classification algorithm so basically it will tell you if you have some categories at, as dependent variable this is kind of uh, a way to go of, as as algorithm and then you have something that is called the kernel trick that kind of uh allow the model to capture nonlinearities. So this is kind of the king of the, mo the, the classification models together with the trees. And, and if you haven't read about, about uh, machine learning, you probably are not really aware of trees, but decision trees are king in machine learning literature, uh, are quite popular. Uh, it can perform both regression and classification task, and it will use some index of impurity, like the Gini index of impurity, not the Gini index that we are used to. And let me show you an example here. So I took this from Wikipedia. So it's the probability of survival in the Titanic. So you get a decision tree, which is says, okay, if you are male, if you are female, your probability of surviving is 73%. And 36% of the population of the Titanic is it is there. So you survive, you know. Uh, but then if you are male, it depends on your age. So the algorithm will measure which part of the population is in is in each category, you know. So for instance, if you have your age here, if your age is is above 9.5 years, you died with 17% of probability. If your age is less than 9.5%, uh, sorry, 9.5 years, it depends if you have siblings. If you have siblings and your siblings are larger or equal than three, you die with 2% of probability. Or if your sibling, if you have less than three siblings, you will survive with 89%. So actually, you know, based on this data set, this is a pretty well known data, data set in machine learning. You're, you are pretty much, you pretty much sur survive or you're safe if you are a female based on this uh, diagram, or if you are a male with less than 9.5 years and you have less than three siblings. Okay. So if uh, the interesting thing here is that you get a graphical representation of the data. And although here I started with a simple example, for example, gender, and I divided here into gen two genders, you can have here a regression. So you can have here a, a continuous, you know, a, um, variable. And you can have more than two um, classification, two classes, or things like that. So it can get really complex and actually there is a kind of uh, um, most powerful um, way of representing this uh, which is which is uh, the random forest so basically instead of having one tree to describe a problem you describe this as several trees and you make them both so if you say okay if i'm male with 
10 years, what is my probability of surviving? Instead of asking one tree, you ask several trees with different data uh, in the same sample. And then you get the vote, okay, what is your probability of surviving? Okay, this is my favorite one. These are neural networks and uh, And there is a lot of jargon here, but let me, if you want to dig into this, just let me know. I, I briefly comment that this is a regression problem. You know, uh, it is basically, uh, you will have a computational graph here, which is kind of interesting when you get really complex and nested formulas, you know, but at the end, this computational graph in, at my right here, uh, basically uh, shows um, I, an equation that you have to fit, you know? So it is that. So for instance, you start with the input layer. You have uh, your X variables, you know? So your features here until Xn, and then you fit this data, this X1 to Xn to the next layer you know, and you, you apply the following transformation. Let me show you the equation here. So you, you have X zero, which is your input data, and the columns, you know, of your, your problem. And then you fit that into the next layer, which is X one. And then you apply, you, you, you apply that to X zero times a, a, some parameters and a function here, which can be usually is non-linear because you will see that if it is linear, it will collapse to a linear function and you don't want that. You want to have non-linear representation of the data. So you have, you apply a function to the input layer, uh, to the input data, and that will constitute a new layer of data, which is here, you know, and put it out with my mouse. And then you move again to another layer, which is X2 here in the equations. You feed X1 that we recently calculated and we, we transform this by the function F2 and we have some parameters there. And this transform is X, X2, okay? And then we feed that to the final layer, which is the output layer, okay? So here in the, the computational graph, and here in the equations, you have y hat is going to do the same, apply some function. Uh, you have some parameters there that you, these parameters is that the ones that you have to calculate or train. And then you have the, 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 the recent calculate layer into this. So if you put everything together, you see that you have a kind of compositional way of doing this. So you have, the fu some function, and then you have nested in a compositional way, all the other functions. So, so this fun once you replace this for several functions, you will see that this thing is really convoluted, you know, and hard to see. But if you change the representation to the right, you will see that it's kind of easier, you know, it gets easier, you know? So, okay, so I talk about the input layer, which is the data, the output layer, which is our uh, prediction, but then you have here the hidden layers. The hidden layers, uh, they are called like that because you don't see that directly, the, rather than, for, for instance, uh, in the input layer, you see the data, in the output layer, you see the prediction, but the hidden layers, you cannot clearly see what's going on there. So, so for that reason, they are coherent layers, but they are just ways to represent transformations of the data. So why then do I have this kind of function here? Because usually in these functions, F1, F2, F3, you have a sigmoid function, which is kind of a nest function that kind of move everything to the center, all the data to the center, okay? so. Uh, so, okay, so first, if you replace any f here by a linear function, you will end up with a linear regression. If you change something by some nonlinearities, you will get something 
uh, completely different and which is the core of uh, the neural network here. In neural network, you can have uh, regression models and classification models. So, and usually it's pretty well known for performing really well uh, for, uh, for um, supervised tasks. Okay, so, so see this neural network zoo. Uh, I have the, 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 the address here. And you can see this, this, uh, uh, these maps, you know, this, the, what they call this, the architecture of the network here. So you have several stuff here with different symbols and all of these things represent functions. So for instance, the one that I show you is basically a deep feed forward uh, network. Okay, here I have more. So you, you get the idea, this is quite complex. I, I hope you don't ask me about this because I, 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 I know probably two or three and the other ones I don't have any idea. So, but I can show you two or three, you know? <laughs> so for instance, I can show you the simplest one, the feed forward, uh, network, which the one that I use, you know, uh, in 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 a paper, uh, it is basically called like that because the information moves forward, so in one direction. So, for instance, here you have the simplest network, and you have the input here, and the input moves by some transformation to the output network. Okay, this could be a linear regression you know, or, or even a, a discrete choice model like logistic or probit, logic or probit model. Uh, also, you have, uh, you have a bit forward when you add a hidden layer and it performs the same kind of uh, transformation, but moving just forward. So information, let me go back a little bit. Information ju just move forward. It doesn't move from any, for example, for, for hidden layer two to the hidden layer one, again, it doesn't do that. Uh, but then you have something more complex with a recurrent neural network, which is kind of a uh, dynamical system because it moves move forward in time, but also can move backward in time inside the same network. So usually you use that for time series. Okay, so this is the kind of the version 2.0 of a representing a time series or even a dynamical system. And it is quite useful. And they are used a lot for representing uh, or understanding test, uh, text, yeah. And then you have something that is quite interesting, which is the autoencoders. The autoencoders, it's basically the idea is that to encode information uh, in a simpler and with less dimensioned uh, way, you know? For instance, you have the input layer here, and you can see that the output layer is of the same dimension as the input layer. Why? Because when you measure the discrepancy between the input layer and the output layer, you want to, you want to encode this in such a way that after you decode this, you get the same information. So you don't, lo you don't lose so too much information. So, so the same data that enters here should be out here. So for that reason, they have the same dimension. But note that in the center, you have something that is less dimensional. So there are two dimensions. So the information gets compressed into two dimensions. And this is actually, this is uh, the representation of principal components analysis. So, but the interesting thing here is that principal component analysis is linear. This can be really non-linear, you know? And yeah, you, I can show you uh, examples of a more convoluted one. For example, here you have a, a encoding way, you end up with a less dimensional representation of the data, and then you decode it into a higher dimension of the data. You know? So you can have a lot of stuff going on there. You know? um, okay, so neural network for dynamical systems. Uh, basically what I did here, I take the, this from, uh, 
Sure, someone asked for the, the slides and uh, references. Sure, no problem. Uh, so basically here you have the, the, the Lorentz differential equation and we are, uh, we are uh, since I assume that most are heterodox people here, we love uh, ODEs, you know, we love ordinary differential equations and we know time series, we love time series based on that. So with neural network, you can simulate, you can learn the, the, these parameters, you know, so that's the cool thing. Here I have the Lorentz, which is chaotic, probably you, you probably all know that. And this is the attractor in the right. And the thing is that, okay, let's learn this with a learning neural network. And here I have the representation in MATLAB. It seems hard, but actually I can show you the code. The code is three lines. So it's, it's that simple, you know? So you have different, dif different layers. You have the input layers, which is the three-dimensional data. You have several hidden layers, which that does the trick of approximating the nonlinear map. And then you have an output layer. Okay. And then here you have the sigmoid function. You can see here, uh, you, this W and B are the parameters, which in machine learning is called weights, the W and B are the biases. And then you have a radial base layer, which is kind of a normal distribution. And then you have a linear layer. So you have, you can have everything the same. It will do the trick, you know, but sometimes usually the output layer is linear. And then the output layer, know that the output layer is three-dimensional too, because we want to learn X, Y, and Z. And then you have here the, the picture of the, some starting points of the real data and the, uh, the, the prediction, okay? So, uh, it does a good job, you know, and it's a chaotic map, so it's it's quite impressive. And and as I told you, this is these are three lines of code in MATLAB, and Python probably is one, so it's really not hard. Okay, so let me go briefly. Anna, you just tell me when I stop. <laughs> I can go forever. No, you can. You have like ten more minutes. Is that okay? Sure. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry if this is so much information, but I try, as I told you, I try to give you the, the, the main, the most broad picture so you can start digging into this. So just send me an email and we can chat about this. I can go forever. So, okay. Well, unsupervised learning. Uh, so basically in unsupervised learning, you don't see the, the dependent variable. You just see the features, the X variable, and you want to learn the unconditional density uh, of your data. Some examples are clustering, denoising, draw, exam draw samples from a distribution. So the main task for unsupervised learning is a lower dimensional representation, which is what principal component does. But also note that I tell you before, uh, I told you before that um, autoencoders that the trees speak to. You have a spar representation, which is basically a spar representation of a matrix is a matrix with a lot of zeros and few entries in the matrix with numbers. So you can easily perform a lot of operations, you know, which are hard in when you have the whole matrix filled with numbers. And independent representation. So for instance, if you have mixed time series, so you have something that is moving really slow, like filtering, you have something that is moving really slow and something that is moving really fast, you would like to separate these two independent or trend cycle decomposition. This is the same thing, you know? So let me show you two, two main unsupervised uh, learning algorithms. The first one that you're probably familiar with is the principal component analysis. And basically what does the principal component analysis, and let me show you an example here. Suppose that you have X1 and X2, and you have some correlate, some data here, and they are correlated. So, in principal component analysis, you find a linear transformation that they correlate linearly these two variables, these two variables. So I represent this, uh, this data into another space in which these, these axes are decorrelated. So they are independent, theta one and theta two. But also you get the idea that um, 
you have some variables that represent most of the data and some other that represent less of the data. So you can choose one of these two. For instance, in this case, theta one has the most variance of the data and theta two has a lot, a lot less variance. So you can actually use theta one to represent the data instead of having two dimensions. Okay, so you reduce the dimension of the data. Um, and, and these variables are decorrelated. Uh, also, you have the, the clustering. What is clustering is basically map the data to some group. Okay, so uh, in this is the classical example of clustering. This is the k-means, sorry, clustering, which is basically um, you start guess, guessing. Let me let me point out these green dots and and purple dots. So you, you guess that some clusters should be here and some other clusters should be here. So suppose that you say, okay, this is the mean. This is probably the mean of that. And I'm going to just guess, you know, that around this mean are going to form some clusters, you know, some data here. But then you iterate and you say, okay, these are the dots which are closer to, to this value, and these are the, the dots closer to this value, and I'll calculate the mean of these dots, and I recalculate this center of mass, which is called, and then I iterate this. Let me show you. This is probably more clear here. So you have, you have, you start with, a, with guessing. So I have this, all of this data. So I say, okay, it seems that some cluster is here to the left, and it seems that the other cluster is to the right. And, uh, and I'm going to say that the cluster is formed by a distance between this black dot and some measure of, of distance, you know? So all the green dots are, are thought to belong to the one cluster and the other ones to the other cluster. But then I take the mean of this data and the class, and that will move the center of mass a little bit. And note that the center of mass of the purple uh, um, set is going to move a lot because most of the data are around here, you know? And then you continue to iterate, you calculate, you know, the data which is in the distance of this center of mass. This is an hyperparameter again. And you calculate that until you kind of converge, you know? So you separate both areas here, okay? So this is the k-mean clustering, which is pretty intuitive, you know? And, and actually, of course, you can, with one or a couple of lines of code in Python or MATLAB, you can do it easily. And finally, <laughs> finally, uh, natural language processing. I'm not gonna go deep in this. I actually have that, uh, I, I believe that um, in many econometric tasks, you can incorporate uh, language, you know, like Twitter or things like that. Not sure if in, econo in heterodox economics that works that well, but it's in the literature at least. Uh, so basically with natural language processing, you want to learn uh, language. And the cool thing about this is this is a time series problem, nothing more like that, you know? So why? Because you, you say, okay, I have a sentence. I have a word there in the middle. I take a window to the left and to the right and see what's the probability of getting that word there. And that's all. So, and you get, of course, the probability of that word given that window to the left and to the right. And then you move to the next word and take the window again and again. So it's a sequence, it's a probability over sequence of words, you know? So it's a time series uh, problem. <clears throat> so, um, so for instance, here you have a uh, sentiment analysis, which has been used in, in, in some e economics application, machine translation, which is basically uh, the machine takes one language and then translate to the other language automatically, q and uh, software and things like that. Okay, so let me show you, this is the, the, the fun part. Uh, so I, I, I go here to this web page, uh, right with transform it, which is transform it, it's kind of a deep learning architecture, but it's specialized for, uh, for uh, natural language processing. 
I need to write something and see how this forecast my, what is the forecast that this, uh, the, this algorithm uh, does. So for, for instance, first I, I wrote today, scientists confirm that the worst possible outcome, the massive asteroid will collide with Earth and I let the algorithm predict the next thing. So you can see at the, at the time of our birth, causing huge earthquake and other impacts on January, this afternoon and so on, you know? Uh, for instance, I put the best way to make a slide is, and you see that it's a still dummy, you know, it's still, it's a huge architecture and it's, you know, a huge amount of people working on this, but it's still not as good as we are, you know, at talking, <laughs> writing. <laughs> so you can see that the best way to make a slide is to watch the screen, to watch the screen on a screen. So we have made it so easy. Okay. Doesn't make any sense. Okay, so let me go to the last one, which I, I love. So for instance, two plus two is equal to, and the thing just completely messed up, you know? They are good with some tasks, but the, look this, two plus two is equal to four with a third, an average of 200, and the amount that a car has to pay in an actual game. So, and this is a state-of-the-art uh, software for natural language uh, processing. Okay, so concluding. Uh, so as I told you, I, I wanted just to make a broad, I give you a broad picture of things that can be done here uh, in machine learning. Um, but you have another topics which are really cool. For instance, you have regularization. I didn't want to cover this here because many of the econometric textbooks use, uh, they kind of cover this regularization. It's, it's more well known in the econometric literature. Uh, but then you have other things that are less known, for example, um, uh, ensemble lear learning, like bagging and boosting, image recognition, and, and deep learning, which is a huge topic. And for if you like dynamical system, uh, neural networks are really cool. And thanks a lot. Thanks, Jose. That was uh, for the inspiring lecture. I think we learned a lot and I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. So if anybody has a question, you can either write on the chat so we can read it or you can just raise your hand or uh, tune in your audio feature so you can ask Jose yourself. So let's go. I was trying to raise my hand, but I, I was kind of lost here. So can I go? <laughs> OK, so uh, thank you, Jose. It was great. Um, I just wanted to go back to that cross-validation. I think that's, that's the name. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was kind of confused about that yellow, those yellow squares. What, sure. why are they different from the test part of the machine learning? I didn't understand that. Could you repeat? Yeah, please? sure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of confusing. Uh, uh, because uh, the problem I, I, you know, I couldn't talk too much here, but uh, the problem here is that sometimes uh, you need to not only fit your model, but also you have to um, see how your hyperparameters work. For instance, the, the degree of the polynomial, you know, but you you have to use only your training set. You never, you have, you don't, you don't have, or you, don't you never use your test set for that um, for the generalization problem? So you leave this out, and and here, for example, what you do is that you kind of take the same here, the difference between training and test, but you do it only in the training set. But note that every time that you move to this to the next fold of the data 
your yellow your yellow box is going to move so you kind of present the whole training set not at once but in different steps so this is a test set you know but since you are presenting at some point this test set for example here here and here it is called validation set so for instance you get for example here you get some measurement of training error and some generalization error or validation error and you can see okay this is two two you know these errors are too different so i'm going to move some hyperparameter so i'm going to kind of tune the degree of the polynomial a little bit or increasing or decreasing and then i check and i retest and i retest again and this is one reason and the other reason is that usually this overall in economics we are constrained by the sample so we have a small sample and we have to make the most out of our samples so you can you cannot really separate this between training set and test set or you can take a small amount of test set so in order to increase this amount of validation set you just use this trick so you get a lot of instance to test your data in the unseen kind of unseen data i don't know if that answered your question yes yes thank you thank you very much so we have a few questions on the chat uh, they are very similar actually so i think most of the people want to know how did you actually apply um, machine learning in your research and how you can indicate that it can be further explored for so Guilherme asked about microeconomics and then he asked about monetary and fiscal policy so if you could share your experience and give some examples I think you would critically answer everyone sure uh so yeah during during the my PhD I was trying to um to kind of empirically find if the relationship between the wage share and the economic activity was could be described as a limit cycle. So at the beginning, I started with classical econometric tools like um, nonlinear regressions, like uh, mesh code models. Uh, but I, I, at some point, uh, I realized that I imposed too much, too much structure on the data. So, which is good, you know. I mean, with you believe in that you are modeling the truth. I mean, it's fine, you know, but I wasn't sure. So uh, what I did is that I tried to, I started to look into the biology. In biology, they use neural network since a lot of uh, years, you know, and then learning from them, I moved to machine learning. But so I used neural network for time series. Actually, I used the, the, Sorry, this is actually from my from a from a paper that is probably uh, coming in some journal soon. <laughs> uh, uh, so I I I use this semi architecture. So I have a, here a time series. I have the labor share and I have the the, the capacity utilization or the output gap or employment rate, and I I fitted this model. And I could calculate, for example, the, the um, I could calculate the um, if the model has the dynamical system has was stable or unstable, you know. Uh, so that's my application. I, it's quite simple now I, that I see that it's quite simple, uh, but it, it helped me to to solve the problem. I actually find that the probability of finding limit cycles in the data is quite uh quite big you know um yeah i don't know i think so i mean just uh thinking aloud i think that's a good way to um to explore some issues overall for heterodox macro because in heterodox macro you don't have the micro foundation so you usually you start with you don't have the functions, you know, that describe the aggregate data explicitly. You have some, you are guessing something, you have, you guess that it overshoots. So you use by default linear models because you believe that, I mean, it's kind of the safest way to go, you know? 
but but I believe that it's crucial to understand nonlinearities, and we emphasize quite a lot. If you have had some courses in in Netralox Macro, you had a lot of emphasis in nonlinearities. But when you estimate the model, you just wipe off the nonlinearities. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. It didn't make any sense to me. But I understand why is that because you don't have a really a wide a guidance. You know, and these models. Uh, can provide that guidance. Why? Because they are flexible enough. So here, I, for, for, for instance, in my paper, I use the def kind of default uh, way of looking into neural network, but you can see here that you can apply any function you want. So you can try a lot of possibilities. You know, you can have your, this is kind of a BR. You have a BR, but with nonlinear components there that you choose and you can test whether this thing will better or not, you know? so. Um, I think it's a, it's it's a, it's a way moving forward in the estimation of models without having to get into the micro foundation to provide functions, and also you don't have to go to the to the relationship between uh, fundamental shocks or structural shocks in which I work, you know, to publish, but but I don't really believe too much, you know. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I can go forever there, so. <laughs> Great, thanks, but I think you answered quite well. So just to for finish up, I think the second part of Femi's question is actually quite good. So uh, the question was, how do you suggest for those of who, us who are getting, who are keen on getting started with using ML for examining economic problems that we start? How can people go from here? First learn Python <laughs> and then afterwards, what are the practical steps? Uh, follow my presentation. <laughs> no, uh, no I, I, I think that uh, first you have to, uh, you have to understand the, 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 the general idea of machine learning. So machine learning is basically you have some type of data and then you apply it for that. And you apply some tools, you know, and also there is, now, nowadays, there is also problems in dynamical system control and things like that. And the only thing that you have to be really careful, because I had this problem a lot before, is that you get really, like, you see some tool and you say, okay, deep learning, oh man, it's amazing. I can apply it to my ODEs and I can estimate, okay, yeah, you can. But the problem is that physicists and mathematicians, they have a lot of data and we don't. So you have to kind of compensate. You have a trade-off between a cool technique that can help you to, for example, to have any nonlinear model that you want in your macro system. But then if you don't have data, really, uh, you have to make some assumptions of linearity there. So for instance, in my paper, I couldn't go for the usual ways of training the data because I didn't get anything because the yeah, I had nearly two, 300 observations and the model didn't behave that well. Uh, but so I had to use a lot of assumptions, kind of, kind of Bayesian assumptions, to impose some structure in a way, you know, to make up, to kind of understand the data. So that's a usual kind of problem that you can have when you start, you find these amazing tools, but they are not directly applicable to to econometrics, you know, because we have several constraints. Uh, if you want to uh, start working in machine learning, I, I think the, the best way is to learn to program in Python. Uh, try to, there is a, there are a lot of courses to learn Python, but I usually, in my experience, you learn more when you apply the language, you, you learn the, the, the basic, but then you apply the data to some specific problems. Um, uh, usually, I tried to learn Python several years ago, but I never couldn't learn because I forgot it after a one week, you know? But now that I'm using it in a daily basis, I kind of, it becomes my, 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 my language, you know, the way I think the problems and things like that. Um, and I, I, in the reference in, so what can you read here? I think the, the best, 
this is a good bibliography. It's the one that I use, you know? I mean, I started with Bishop and then I, I learned a little bit of statistical learning. And, and, and then Steve Branton, actually he has a, a YouTube channel which is amazing. I mean, he is amazing. And he makes this data-driven science with machine learning and dynamical system, you know? It's really great, you know? I mean, the only problem is, again, that you cannot apply directly, uh, it, you cannot apply these tools directly to your problem. And that's cool because we have we have job, you know? Otherwise, they will take over us. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much, Jose, for your lecture and for your insights. I think you really helped everyone here. And if you can, you can share the slides with me or not now with the chat. I, I don't think, I don't know if that's easy, but if you, if you if you can share with us now, I can email everyone later. But oh, if you, yeah. So if you have another, so if you have, so uh, your papers, if they're like, uh, already published or you have working papers, you could also send it to us and and we can share, I can share with, with everyone who attended the lecture and yeah, so I think you can give everyone a better grasp, grasp of how you apply machine learning. Uh, there, there's another question, but do you have time? Can you answer the last sure. question? Sure, <laughs> all the time. So, one <laughs> asked, so he asked me if you, if you yeah, you mentioned NLP and sentiment analysis. Could you maybe talk a bit about some potential applications for heterodox macro, especially related to, to central bank communication? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not a specialist in this area, but um, actually, let me, give me one second, because I had something like this in my presentation, but since it was too long, I, I didn't include it, so let me compile the latex. Yeah. So um, yeah, so basically what you do is, this is a time series problem. I mean, you have uh, you have some words and these words are, uh, are in some context. So you want to understand not only the word, there are techniques for that because you have a dictionary, you know, and you can look for that word in that dictionary, you know, but you want to understand the whole context. So there are some sentences which are uh, positive or negative and the computer can decide on that. So let me see if... Okay, let's go. Give me one second. Let me share my screen. There. So I had that, but didn't want to show it. I'm not expert either. So, so but basically here you have a, a, a text, you know, and this text will shift the sentiment, you know, based on the, the, the learn model. So you have a model that learns some sentiments and, you know, learning basically means it learns the parameters in a time series sequence and you can kind of say, okay, for in this part, the green area is more positive, okay? So you have something more positive here, you can read here. You have less positive in yellow and you have really on bad negative sentiment if you are in red, you know? Now, what you can do for, for, for the communication of central banks, what I have seen is that you want to transform this sentiment in the statement into data. So you can do that because you have, you can encode the positiveness of your statement and then, and then uh, put that in a regression model. So you can see, okay, if, for example, dummy variable, positive or negative, you can, if you recognize that the statement is completely positive, you put a one in positive and you, or you put a zero if this is negative, and then you have a measurement uh, a feature that uh, that will kind of capture how this sentiment can affect some economic variable. Okay, I I don't know the details there, but I believe 
that it works that way. I don't know what, what else to say. I don't know if that, that, that answer. I think my internet kind of froze, but yeah, <laughs> but I, I listened to the, the rest. So thank you so much Jose, for your presentation, for, yeah, for your availability of sharing your, all of your knowledge with us. And yeah, I see, I'm very grateful cool and I, I kind of learn a lot. And for now on, it's kind of a lot easier. And if you can, you can share with me uh, the, the slides and then I will send uh, to everybody through the YSI directory. So it's kind of quite easy. You can actually select everyone who participated and then you'll send an email. So then I can share the slides with everyone. So uh, I think that's it, we can close now. Thank you so much. Do you want to say something before we finish? Oh, yes. Thanks for listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, no, yeah. that was easy. Uh, <laughs> that was very easy. <laughs> no, yeah, I, so. if you have any question, I mean, or you want to dig on something, just let me know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love this topic. So anything that I can help or maybe dig deeper, just, just let me know. I mean, it's a lot of fun for me. Oh, good. And uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. What it was nice, it would be nice to have hands on particle sections. Uh, yeah, I agree. We will try to yeah. plan that for Definitely. the future. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, bye everyone. See you next time. And yeah, bye bye. You have a great day. Bye, Jose. Bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose and Anna.